production of immense possibilities is made possible by the generous support of the Whole Systems Foundation, advancing well-designed projects that conserve resources and reduce waste and chemical pollution. Asante, providing comprehensive quality health care services in a compassionate manner to Southern Oregon and Northern California. Rogue Co-ops, a community-centered collaboration between the Ashland Food Co-op, the Grange Co-op, Rogue Credit Union, and the Medford Food Co-op. The Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Events Center, Elizabeth York, and these additional members of the Immense Possibilities Community Builders Circle. And this evening's edition of the program is underwritten by a special grant from the Elizabeth G. Mon Charitable Foundation. That moment of wonder is the source of all spiritual growth. How can we cut that off? How can we cut children off from that source of wonder? This generation will share the planet with nine billion people. And uh, part of what they'll need to be able to figure out is how we're going to allocate these resources in the environment itself. I identified a water beetle because I saw something brown and it had antennas but, and it had like short legs. And then when you ask them what they've learned and they, and they share with you what they've discovered and it's a result of what you've taught them, that's, that's the moment. That's the moment that I love. They need to be able to know that it's just not them in the middle of the forest. There's so much more around them. You know, just go pick up a rock and look what's under it. So we're going to talk about the beaches, the oceans, the rivers, the lakes. And we're going to talk about how they get dirty and all the things we can do together to help keep them Welcome to our weekly visit with people who are creating immense possibilities for healthy communities and solutions to all kinds of challenges. A common element of healthy communities is a certain sense of place, and that includes an understanding and appreciation of the natural environment in and around the places we live. That's why more and more teachers, students, and volunteers are coming together for a variety of adventures that are all different approaches to environmental education. <laughs> covered with water, but today they're exposed, that means they're uncovered, we get to explore. It's a bit no plan. Oh, see one. See one. See one. I identified a water beetle because I saw something brown and it had antennas but and it had like short legs. It's a long way from the inner cities of the Bay Area to the mountain settlement of Pinehurst in Oregon's Southern Cascade Mountains. But what they share is a commitment to help their kids understand and learn to care for the place they live. With me now is Pinehurst Middle School teacher Jim Impara, who started and runs the environmental education program for his rural school district. Jim, welcome to Immense Possibilities. It's good to have you there. Thank you. So your kids already live in a natural environment. What fired you up to get this program started? Uh, the Green Springs, of course, is a beautiful place. And uh, to keep children encased inside a classroom for six hours a day, 180 days a week, just didn't seem right. Uh, and on top of that, we have a very generous community, very supportive administration and school board. So all these things kind of align to make this almost an inevitable thing to do. Mm -hmm. So give me an idea of what you do in this program. What's an activity or two that really triggers the excitement and involvement of the kids? Getting outdoors is an important part of it. Uh, no matter how well the lesson is prepared, it's still within a very controlled and contrived environment. And when you're indoors. When we're indoors, right. And the moment we step outdoors, though, all the stimulus, all the things happen that are just uh, 
way beyond whatever you can recreate in a classroom, and it, the kids respond to that. Is there an ideal age, a perfect age, to be taking kids out for this kind of learning? Well, I teach middle school, of course, and uh, the beauty of middle school is that um, the children are still learning, there's still that wonder of what's underneath that rock. And, but about this time, the conceptual abilities start to kick in, so we can start to introduce those abstract scientific principles that they can now start to understand. And so the two kind of become merged together as they start to understand the world around them, and they can take this forward with them. So you brought a, a short slideshow with you today, right? Yes, I did. It was prepared by uh, JD and uh, Ivy and um, Kaya, and uh, Ivy and Kaya will uh, narrate it. Pinehurst School is not only special for its small community, but also for the incredible outdoor program it provides. Kindergarten through eighth graders take part in our outdoor education that ranges from making gardens and learning about compost to hiking around the Green Springs on Fridays and spending almost two weeks in the Grand Canyon. We don't just go on out-of-state field trips. We travel around our community spreading Pinehurst joy throughout the Green Springs. Every year we go on field trips to the Boxer Ranch Wilderness Area to study macroinvertebrates and help the BLM learn more about the condition of the creek. We do reforestation projects and remove invasive plant species in the Cascade Siskiyou National Monument. Lectures and in-school projects can be interesting, but there's nothing like the experience of actually going outdoors and traveling to go see with your own eyes, to touch with your own fingers, and to learn just by being there. If you can learn how to apply things that you learned in the classroom to real-life situations, it will help you in future situations. It's inspirational, amazing, and it touches us deep in our hearts. You brought with you another couple of your students. Would you introduce us to them? Yes, I brought uh, two-fifths of our graduating class this year. This is J.D. Hi. and Drake. Hello. Both eighth graders. J.D., Drake, thanks for coming. It's really good to have you Thank here. Thank you. Thank you for having well, me. Well, first of all, just tell us, give us an idea of what environmental education at Pinehurst is like. Well, what is something that you've done there that was really fun and really instructive for you? Well, usually every year we do, we go down to a local ranch, and there's the creek through the valley there. It's they te BLM tests it every year for microinvertebrates and the health of the creek. And we'll go down with them and we'll help collect out of the creek different organisms. And it's just so much, it's so interesting to learn all the stuff. Drake, if, if you were just sitting in the classroom and you had books about all this and the BLM studies and all that and just learned right there in the classroom, what, what would be different? When you read in a book, you're, you're just looking at it. It's a picture, you know, it's just paint put on a page. When we go out there to the creek, we actually pick up whatever macroinvertebrates we're looking at and study them and we get a feel for what we're learning. Even if you're in a like a city, you can still go to like a park or something and you can always just make up things and be really creative with it. So and kids need this. It's it's like part of the natural human development. Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and would you say it generates more curiosity? Does it make you want to go out and find out more about what's going yeah. on? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Definitely. So, Drake, I'm pretty clear you think this is important education, probably that every kid should get a shot at it. Why do you feel strongly about that? It is important for every child and kid to be able to go outside, even if it's to a park or straight out in the middle of nowhere in a forest. They need to be able to know that it's just not them in the middle of the forest. There's so much more around them. You know, just go pick up a rock and look what's under it, and you'll see that you're not the only one in that forest. Mm. There's so much other stuff around you. Mm. Jim Impara, let's say a public administ school administrator is watching and going, yeah, this sounds really good, but it's out of our reach. We've got these budget problems. It's, it's really in a luxury that we can't do right now. What, what would you like them to think about? Tell them it works. Uh, Pinehurst uh, recently was designated by the State of Oregon is a Category 5 school, and what that means is that based on general tests uh, that they give to everyone, uh, we're in the top 10 percent of all the schools in the, uh, in the state. It's such a part of them, and it also makes it so much easier to make connections as you're teaching, and things that actually have a meaning to the children, and they can take it with them and they remember it. And so they kind of build upon that to, be to become better students, which I guess is what the test is all about, but also ultimately, you know, to become better citizens. What is the immense possibility of the work that you're doing? Well, this generation will share the planet with nine billion people. And uh, part of what they'll need to be able to figure out is how we're going to allocate these resources in the environment itself. 
And uh, if they're intimate with that environment, uh, then they can make truly intelligent and humane decisions. And uh, that would be kind of the legacy we could leave them. Jim Impara of Pinehurst Middle School. Uh, Drake and JD, thanks very much for coming and being on Immense Possibilities with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. All right, is everybody ready? Yeah. All right, I'm going to ask you a few questions. How many like the beach? Very good. Put your hands down. How many like clean water? Very good. Put your hands down. How many like to breathe? All right, just checking. So we're going to talk about the beaches, the oceans, the rivers, the lakes, and we're going to talk about how they get dirty and all the things we can do together to help keep them clean. This is where I live. Where's that? Very good. Do we all live there? Yeah. We all get that. All right, just checking. This is how you get rid of six-pack rings. Hold on. Say it. You don't buy six-pack rings. Give this person a big round of applause. Are you ready? Yeah! More like 650,000 by now, actually. And Michael Klubach talks to thousands more each year. And joining us now from his home in Southern California is environmental educator Michael Klubach. Michael, welcome to Immense Possibilities. It's great to have you here. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me, Jeff. Let me ask you how you got started on all this, because you didn't come at it from an, from an educational perspective. How did you get started? Well, you know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm from New England, and I love the beaches and oceans and always swimming and sailing and boating. And I, and I came out to California and continued with that. And um, being at the beach, I naturally gravitated toward doing beach cleanups and and um, and just took a look around and realized, wow, this this ocean that I love and that I, you know, I was swimming in and sailing in needs a little help. And and uh, got involved with environmental groups here in Los Angeles that were involved in beach cleanups and working with, uh, you know, getting kids out to the beach. And I thought, well, there's a there's a great idea. Let me let me go to schools. It just sort of it popped into my head, and I, I, I created a slideshow about the beaches and oceans and how the animals are entangled in the trash and storm drain pollution and went to one school and then two and then three. Michael, you founded Kids Ocean Day. What is that? It's a very simple teaching model of show people something they love, show it being damaged, give them something to do about it. So we show them all the happy fish and the, and the animals and the whales and then we show them tangled up in the trash. And we show the impact of the trash and debris that's thrown into the ocean and what it does to the animals. And we also connect them so they understand that the trash that's dropped on the street makes its way down through the storm drains into the ocean and, and, and entangles and feeds the fish that we eat. And so uh, that's the, the educational part of it. And the engagement part of it is actually getting the kids to the beach and getting their hands into the sand. Imagine a day where thousands of kids and teachers are inspired to participate. Imagine an organization teaching kids and teachers about cleaning the beaches and oceans. Through Kids Ocean Day programs, I learned that we all make a difference whether we know it or not. When we work together, we can accomplish great things. What I do today affects tomorrow. It's time to keep our ocean and beaches clean. All we have to do is listen. And then they, they uh, are involved in an art contest where they, they draw in pictures in response to the assembly. And for their art, uh, become a giant art piece uh, that we do at the beach and we take pictures of it with the helicopters. You know, mostly I hear great excitement about these kinds of events, cleanups and whatnot, Michael. But I've also heard criticisms of these kinds of events as lulling us into complacency, to giving the message that, you know, let's just clean up trash and we'll solve the problem. We've done enough. I actually look at the kids that I'm talking to as the future uh, captains of industry. And if they got the connection that there is an impact, there's an impact with that one little piece of plastic that a bird eats and it kills a bird. And I think if you're grown up with that consciousness that as you, as you, uh, have have a larger corporation and a larger company and you have a bigger impact on the world, 
you're, you're going to be more connected to the world around you and you're going to make decisions that uh, don't harm um, the, the world that we live in. You know, Michael, you've made this a big part of your life. Well, why is that? What fuels you to keep doing this? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love the moment when, I, uh, when th there's a moment in education, and this is the aha moment for uh, most of the teachers that I've talked to, is that when they give you back what they've discovered from your teaching, when you know you've you've educated and spoken and taught to uh, taught them, and then when you ask them what they've learned, and they and they share with you what they've discovered, and it's a result of what you've taught them. That's that's the moment. That's the moment that I love and that I enjoy, and and, and I I I just uh, I thrive on that. And um, you know this is what I see. Uh, with with what I do, and this is what I see when the kids are at the beach and they discover that um, you know, they have an impact on the world. We, we were just in Hong Kong last week, and one of the kids on the video just said, I I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering when people are going to stop littering. And drop the mic. There it is. There's the end of, you know, that's, that's, the discovery that, uh, and, the, and the questions from the kids that uh, I love to hear. What is the immense possibility of the work you do, Michael? The immense possibility is a clean ocean. The possibility that I've been working under for, for 20 years and the intention is a sustainable and healthy planet for all life. And so the immense possibility is a clean ocean that is sustainable and that thrives and that it, it provides oxygen for us and provides food for us. So there it is, there's the dream. Michael Klubach, environmental educator, thanks very much for being with us on Immense Possibilities. Thanks for the work that you're doing out there. It's been a pleasure being on your show, and I thank you very much for inviting me and, um, and continuing with the work that you're doing. Thank you. Of course, environmental education isn't just for children. We hope that everybody would want to participate in an SFI course because we have so much fun at it. But the people who tend to enjoy SFI the most are the people who have some kind of innate curiosity, especially for the natural world. Somebody who would be walking down the street in a town and say, now that's a really interesting pinkish rock and I wonder why it would be pink on the inside and white on the outside. This region is basically a an area of conifer diversity, and it's not matched anywhere else on the globe. We have more species of conifers in this area concentrated than any other place on the planet. SFI is the Siskiyou Field Institute, a world-renowned center of environmental education located in Southern Oregon's Illinois Valley. And with us is its executive director, Daniel Newbery. Daniel, welcome to Immense Possibilities. It's great to have you here. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. Tell us a little bit about your own commitment to environmental education. Why is it so important to you? You know, here in Southern Oregon, Jeff, we live in one of the most biodiverse regions of the entire continent. Uh, called the klamath Siskiyou ecoregion. And I think if people really understood what they have in their own backyard here in terms of um, natural resources, that they would be more likely to make sure that this is available to future generations. And that's where environmental education comes in. I think education is really the long-term solution because when people have that information, they can make decisions for themselves. Mm -hmm. Is there any important difference between the approaches of environmental education for children and for adults? Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, you look at children, and most of the children that we work with are middle school age kids. And kids are really at a, a place in their lives where that wonder about the outdoors is really there, and they really appreciate the, the hands-on nature, and we really uh, you know, work with that especially hands-on learning. Um, we do some of that with the adult classes that we have too, but kids, they're just in a, a special sort of magical age where um, they really have that wonder and it's very easy to teach. When you're working with adults, one thing you have to be careful of is preaching to them. Um, you really just need to present the information, present the science, and, and let the people come to their own conclusions. Mm -hmm. And I, I think as long as you stay away from trying to, you know, force feed them something, 
um, you, you do okay. And that's where the field learning really comes in because people can actually see things. You don't have to just tell them, you can show them. You know, uh, environmental education, odd or not, has turned into a, a political issue. And uh, it has some opponents, and especially of children, of uh, environmental education in the schools. The criticism goes something like, we're, we are propagandizing children when we have environmental education. We're telling them to think one way on controversial issues. What do you think when you hear criticism like that? Well, for somebody to really learn, they have to start off by understanding the vocabulary you use and understand the scientific concepts, and then they can come to the conclusions themselves. I mean, we're not talking about policy at all. We're just talking about how do you understand the natural world around you? Mm -hmm. Every once in a while in one of our adult classes, you know, you might get an instructor who might make a comment to try to draw a parallel with something that's um, a current issue that's at the national level or something. And there may be somebody in the class who disagrees or who has a strong feeling about that issue and they'll feel like, you know, someone's trying to, you know, provide propaganda. But that's really something that comes up, you know, very rarely. Are there volunteer opportunities at your organization, even for people who may not have a lot of background in environmental education? Oh, absolutely. You know, we, we have an 850-acre property out there, and it's a lot to take care of. So several times a year, we'll have days where, um, you know, a couple dozen volunteers will come out and help to take care of the place, whether it be landscaping um, or, or planting trees or something like that. So there definitely are opportunities there, and of course, helping out on our fundraisers is always a great opportunity, but yeah. What is the immense possibility of the work that you do, Daniel? We really want to be a regional center to teach people about the biodiversity of the region we have. So really our dream is to, you know, attract a lot more people to our programs. We have more capacity. It's just about getting the people here mm -hmm. so they can understand what an incredible place that we live in. Daniel Newbury is executive director of the Siskiyou Field Institute in Southern Oregon. Daniel, thanks very much for joining us on Immense Possibilities. Thanks for the work that you do as well. Oh, thank you very much, Jeff. I enjoyed being here. You might remember an earlier IP episode on children and nature and the people working hard to make sure the kids get outside to enjoy and appreciate the natural world. We're genetically wired uh, to need nature. Beyond that, there's the issue just of wonder. Wonder is probably the most important word in Last Child in the Woods. Uh, that moment when you were three or four and went out into the backyard, maybe crawled out into the weeds and found a rock and turned it over and found that you were not alone in the universe. Here's one thing that I've learned about this and it's that adults, especially adults that haven't gotten a chance to get outside as kids mm -hmm. and do very much, won't let their kids get that much experience outside either. Children are so much op more open to what they can do and their learning possibilities and you don't have the behavior problems when you're outside as you do when you put people in the little boxes. Do you know why that is? Well, a lot of us don't like being in little boxes. <laughs> <laughs> One of our guests was Bill Hunt, director of the Klamath Outdoor Science School. We wanted to have Bill back to see what's gone on in his world since the show was on. Well, you know, it's amazing 2013. Uh, we, we had uh, a lot of programs. We're at a really good spot where Gray Family Foundation and Apex Block have come forward with some funding to help us continue and finish the pavilion and the restrooms for the Sun Pass site. And how will you use those facilities? What are they going to be about? Well, those facilities for our resident education programs. Uh, we have for the schools throughout the region. Um, for the Basically, we'll be able to have like 60 kids a week coming out and staying inside this, the yurts. I'm excited about it because this will be where it'll be, we'll be able to push into the seasons more into the fall and into the spring earlier because one of our issues in Southern Oregon is spring can sometimes be late coming and having nice warm dining hall and showers. So you're flourishing, you're less of a well-kept secret than you used to be too. Yes, that's what's ex one of the most exciting. We have a, a really full May and, and our summers are looking filling up and it's exciting. We have a lot of schools calling and trying to get on board. 
That's good. If people want to help, if people want to get involved in the work that you do, how can they do that? Well, the best thing, we're needing both volunteers and paid staff, you know, for the coming January and on in the season. So um, they can either call us at our office, look it up on the website. When they get their No Child Left Inside bumper sticker, they can see the website on the bottom. And um, uh, contact me or my office. That's great. Bill, you're doing great work. I'm glad that people are finding out about it. Thanks for checking in with us again, and we'll see you down the road. Thank you very much. And that is it for this edition of Immense Possibilities. You can find more content. Send us suggestions at immensepossibilities.org. Find us on Facebook. You can like and share us there. Until next time, I'm Jeff Golden. Please do what you can do.